two years ago, we got a phone call from Tyler Brock, and he said we made it. We made it, dude. You know that mission that Jules and I went on in Columbia, told you about? We finally made it back. Coming from the wizard's eye, I took a bus into Medellin to meet up with my good buddy Jules, one of the best kayakers in the world and certainly the person who's explored Colombia the absolute most from the seat of a kayak. He had this crazy idea to paddle one of the largest rivers in Colombia. Our goal was to head over the hill to Santa Rosa, which is a series of three or four incredibly long bus rides, a 24-hour journey, just to get to the put-in of the Calcate to reach Araquara in the center of the Colombian Amazon. Long, wild train of chivas, buses, trucks, spectacular moments. With all the logistics, Jules just being able to communicate a little bit better than I did. I always felt like I was one step behind Jules trying to figure out the aspects of this trip. Is that the party bus? bus? Yeah. There's a bus that leaves at 9 that can bring us closer, so it's, seven, it's one hour. We should wait and get that bus that brings us closer. We had to put our kayaks on the bus multiple times in the day fast-flung Spanish as you figure your way out from one bus to the next, which is always this balancing act, trying to get him to stay on top. What we found out when we got to Santa Rosa is that the weather is vastly different between the northern regions and the southern regions. And it turns out that it was rainy season and the river was just about as flood as it could be. Santa Rosa is literally a town at the end of the road, an old town that was controlled by the FARC for a really long time and town very much just sort of put together Tin roofs just seem to stretch on. Any practical thing that could possibly keep you dry. The locals are so curious as to what's going on. Clearly, we stick out like a sore thumb. They're very concerned for us. The river is this place that everybody's scared of, especially when it's like this flooded. And I think one of the questions that we were answering is just, are you gonna be okay? Don't go down there, it's dangerous. So we were constantly having to try to explain ourselves. Okay, here we are, the put-in, the Calcata River, right near the headwaters. It's the birthplace of the Calcata, massive water. Calcata! It's hard to describe the feelings putting in on such a massively flooded first descent. I mean, the, everything is just so elevated doing a river that nobody's done before. And pretty quickly putting on the Calcata, we were totally taken aback by just how big and powerful this whitewater is. It's definitely a lot more than I was anticipating, and it just sort of set the stage for what was going to be one of the longest, gnarliest expeditions of my life. here to the trailhead where we're meant to meet up with a couple of horses. Maybe they're donkeys, maybe they're horses, we don't know. Yeah, donkey for days right now. It's rainy season. You're gonna get covered in mud and scramble through that mountain for a while. After the day on the river yesterday, seeing how gnarly this river is super high, we're deciding to portage around the upper canyon, about 20 kilometers, depending on where we can put in. 
The loose plan is we're gonna hike with our kayaks for about five or six hours, hopefully make it across some river forts, and then meet a team of horses coming up from Desconso. Beautiful day in the jungle here. Paradise living the dream. <laughs> Looking down into the river, we could tell we had made a good decision portaging around this top canyon. What we could see was flooded, massive white water. We met a guy and his wife and a couple of kids who decided to help us portage the top canyon. The trail just cut through some of the most beautiful jungle, and it was really our first taste of what we were about to experience for the next 1,000 kilometers downstream. The people of the Upper Calcutta were most friendly, welcoming people I've ever run into. They, I'm sure, had never helped anybody bring kayaks into this region before. And they were just so curious and supportive of what we were doing and definitely agreed with us that it was a good idea that we were portaging the top section of this river. Their uh, chickens were riding along in our kayaks on the way downstream. The circus definitely coming through town. We spent lunch at this roadhouse along the trail. The people lived there and made a little bit of money as travelers came by and would feed them meals. It was definitely this amazing experience continually to be invited into people's houses and get fed meals and just seeing the way that people live in such remote part of the planet. Hiring horses was just a process of asking around, finding somebody willing to take us, and then paying them a sort of constant barter and negotiation process. All right, so we're getting down here to the end of the portage today, pitching a lift on a horse for the last part, much better than the first part, which was carrying the kayak for five hours. So happy to be on a horse. River's massive, absolutely flooded, super steep. Terrible idea to be in there. And right here is where confluence meets, we believe, and marks the end of the major gradient. Let's see what the river looks like below here, but it's huge, it's massive. So stoked for these kind people that are helping us through this portage. Easy, buddy. I'm thankful to this horse. Yeah. So we're on the bridge, number 52. Been looking at this river for about 60 kilometers and it was definitely way, way too flooded and way too canyoned up to, to run. Now we got to a section that looks manageable. We have about 30 k's of this and maybe quite a bit harder uh, coming ahead. So we're gonna give it a try. I'm kind of tired of carrying that kayak. You know, kayaks are made to be on the water, not on the land. So we're gonna use them for what they're supposed to. Here we are at the put-in three days later. <laughs> We've just been showing the most amazing hospitality here. We're excited. Today we do a lot of gnarly kayaking, so here we go. This is a place where the river begins to open up a little bit. It comes out of the canyon and has lower gradient, but is still a flooded, massive river with giant white water. survival kayaking. The style of navigating the river is to always look for eddies and ways out, but here on this flooded jungle river, it's actually almost impossible. High, the higher the river, it means that there's hardly any eddies, any places that you can stop, and so you sort of end up getting flushed through in this really big, volume whitewater. Pretty intensely intimidating. We took turns leading our way down this absolutely huge river, big rapids, and this style of read and run kayaking is definitely some of the scariest kayaking you can possibly do.
the line is right, right to left. Definitely not left. Jules is one of the best teammates I can possibly ask for. Communication isn't always perfect at times. He is absolutely the best person that he could possibly be with. Having not paddled much with Jules before, I didn't know what it was going to be like, but it turned out that we became a really tight team on the river, able to pretty much trust each other at any possible moment, and definitely attributed a lot to us being able to get through this section of river safely and successfully, it was just being able to operate well and paddle on a similar level and make good decisions when it came to what to run and what not to run. All sorts of plants and bugs and just sweaty and hot or cold and frigid, but always pokey and wet and damp and just uncomfortable. There was really not much shelter. And the only way that we could actually really camp in the jungle was with hammocks and a tarp. There's no way that you could just even physically lay a tent or a sleeping pad on the ground and sleep there just because it's so buggy and moist and snakes and all of the fine critters running the uh, Amazonian jungle. Finally, we made it to what Jules calls the metallic bridge. It's the end of the first descent portion of the upper Kakheta. Therefore, we're dropping into the big and last canyon before the Amazonian basin. Sunshine for about 10 minutes a day, and it's now. From here, this canyon has been paddled a couple of times, but certainly never at this level. This was our first big goal of reaching on the expedition, and we paddled into what we knew was going to be one of the most difficult sections of white water on the run. The main canyon of the Calcate on this upper river is absolutely surreal. The river squeezes between two vertical walls just glowing in the afternoon sun, paddling through this fine mist and rainbows, and reaching up into just some of the deepest jungle I've ever seen with waterfalls pouring off the sides. I mean, you almost vibrated with the energy of this entire place. And this is like one of the most powerful places I've ever experienced. Floating through this canyon of the Calcato is absolutely magic. It was one of the most special experiences I've ever had on the river paddling through that canyon of the Calcato. The river continually kept growing, getting fed by tributaries, becoming bigger and bigger. This canyon of the Calcata was proving to be right on the edge of runnable. So we are now into the, the plain, you know, the beginning of the Amazon. That last canyon on the Calcata was, was really a trip, and we, we kind of got lured in there by some sunshine, and, high water, but still like marginally runnable levels. So we kind of got punished for the blessings we got at the beginning. Putting this first major obstacle of the expedition out of our way was one of the milestones, exiting the Calcata Canyon into this huge flat water section that we were about to have to traverse. It was sort of bittersweet. It was amazing to have gotten through all that white water, days of portaging and nights and nights camping. And now we were entering into a completely different phase of the expedition. We were arriving at the 700 kilometers of flat water that we were going to have to try to paddle or hitchhike. Just the energy of this entire trip, having such a massively flooded river that we had just navigated and were continuing to navigate, we very much became travelers of this river, trying to figure out any means possible to keep the forward momentum going, headed for one of the biggest canyons, the Araquara. We were definitely skeptical as to what we might find downstream.
At one point, we were riding in a canoe so loaded down it was barely above the water. One of us had to volunteer to ride in the kayak behind the canoe just to keep the load afloat and keep us moving down the river. We were starting to enter indigenous territory of the Witoto people, and this was going to be one of the most incredible parts of the trip. people of this land are the Witoto people, and their culture and villages are absolutely fascinating. These communal houses of the Witoto are the center of the village, and sort of everything revolves around this communal house, all of the spiritual ceremonies, all the mambe ceremonies, the making of the mambe, which is made of a uh, coca leaf and a catalyst, which is a sort of a burned leaf, and they pulverize it and chew it, and then it provides for them a spiritual essence and, and connection. The way that these people are living in harmony with the land is absolutely beautiful. You just know you have so much to be able to learn from these people. We were always welcomed into these houses. We would have conversations with the chief and the people. The most important and special part of the Kaketa Araquara expedition was the opportunity to live and travel with the indigenous people of this land. The uh, last day before our quarter here. About to paddle down six hours and hopefully finally get to Ara Quarter. Two weeks. Two weeks later. I've got a parrot helping me pack here. Hey, buddy. Here we go, 20 more kilometers to go until Araucuara. Tyler is starting to feel sick. Hopefully it's not the infamous dengue or malaria that sort of like lingers around those woods. This first canyon just above Araucuara is this place of local legend. Bro, there's quite a sizable whirlpool down here. It's fucking big. A very difficult place for the local people to navigate. Being here in the rainy season, there is just these huge waterfalls. And we were some of the first people to be able to go through there and document this place. Aside from the indigenous tribes around the area and the occasional passerby, these are very, very seldom visited places in the world. Bro, that would be fucking intense in a motorboat. I hope we don't have to find out. Upstream would be fucked up too, dude. Got a little swirly. So I think this is that one straightaway, and then we turn the corner from where we can see there. We have another straightaway about the same size, and then we're there, right? End of our quarter. The end of the journey to our quarter. Journey to our quarter, bro. Then we don't even know what the fuck's gonna happen when we get there. <laughs> Yeah. 
Finally, we reached the Araquara Canyon. We took out, walked around on river left, and then hiked back up the river right side to get a view of these rapids. Huge beyond my imagination. So crazy to see such a force of water. 14 days on the Caqueta, and here we are at Araquara. The rapids are obviously way too flooded to run, but just uh, an invitation for us to come back because within the few minutes you arrive here, the few first hours you're here, you realize this is a very, very special place loaded with historical and cultural fact and knowledge, hidden little natural wonders, cliffs, caves, waterfalls, swarming with wildlife, and, and yeah, we'll definitely be back. What kind of location you want to come and settle, settle a little house and run that shit on the daily. Yeah, Araucara marks the end of our journey. It's not the end of the river, so maybe we'll come back and, and finish it a bit later. But uh, but it, it was really a life-changing uh, experience to, to follow a river from its source to, to way deep down. We really had no idea how we were going to leave Araucara. We had missed the scheduled flight that we were thinking we would get out on. Yeah, so we've been waiting for this plane for about three hours. It's came, turned around because it had some engine failure, and then about half the village is waiting here to ship some stuff and to kids, wives, husbands, grandmothers. It's the only way in and out of here, so you can imagine how much tension and, you know, associated with this beautiful antique flying machine. It doesn't look that new. <laughs> it's shiny, but it's not new. <laughs> There's also the whole battalion of the military that are um, searching everybody. Our experience in Araucara is probably not over, at least not for a few hours. Hopefully not a few days. There's no time frame here. See you in a month. <laughs> <laughs> and that's hopefully the ride out of here. Araucara. Adios. Flying away from Araquara, I definitely felt like that was the end of the expedition. And I really had no idea of the long reaching effects that this was going to have on me. I ended up returning to the United States and finding out the hard way that I had gotten a flesh eating parasite called mucosal leishmaniasis that was slowly eating the my. Um, my lips off of my face. It was crazy. These open wounds were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, I got it diagnosed as leishmaniasis that I had picked up in the Amazon from uh, sand flies. And the treatment took about a month. It was one month of chemotherapy to uh, get rid of leishmaniasis and another couple months of recovery. And honestly, after the whole experience of the expedition, being so grateful to have been in there and getting leishmaniasis, a month of chemotherapy, healing, getting better, and then recently I've been invited to go back to finish what we started there and paddle this, uh, this canyon. Jules is creating a documentary about the environmental and cultural destruction of the Amazon and these huge big water canyons that exist deep, deep, deep in the Amazon. And it looks like after all of this, we might be returning to Artaquara.